Good evening. I think I'm officially beginning this program. There were three New York Times headlines last week on three consecutive days that I think perfectly set the stage for this debate. The first one was on Friday, and it was the headline on the lead story in the business section of the Times. I'm sure everybody in this room saw some version of this. The headline was, Google reaches a trillion dollars in value, even as it faces new tests. So basically that puts, that story is telling um, the world that Google is now in that elite market cap club with Microsoft and Amazon and Apple. So that was the first story. Speaking of Google and Amazon and Apple, the second story came on Saturday. And that headline, also leading the business section of the paper, was please stop big tech, small rivals tell lawmakers. So that was a story that was reported from a congressional hearing that I think was held in Colorado where small tech companies like Sonos and Tile and PopSocket, by the way, products many of us in this room use, CEOs of those companies were in front of Congress talking about how big tech stifles their ability to compete or their innovation. And then there was a third headline that made me think of this debate, and it was on Sunday, and it did not lead the business section of the paper. It actually led the whole paper, and the headline was, the secretive company that might end privacy as we know it. I see a lot of heads nodding. Many of you saw it. My friend and colleague, Kashmir Hill, um, did a very deeply reported story about a little company called Clearview that makes facial recognition technology, which is now quietly being used by hundreds of law enforcement officials all over America and potentially in other places in the world. And it's begging all kinds of questions about potentially dystopian future in which privacy is, is compromised. So I think all three of those headlines kind of get at both the promise and the peril of this moment that we're living in, and they get at the idea that the stakes on this debate that you are about to hear are really high, and that we here in Davos and everywhere are in a place where we can probably not punt anymore on these very big questions about how tech is reshaping all of our lives. So I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Meredith copet levian I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the New York Times. I'm also a lover of good arguments. Um, I see a number of people in the room who were here with us last year in this very room for another debate in this format. This is actually, I think, the seventh New York Times Oxford style debate that we've done. It's the second one here in Davos. I can tell you last year that we had sparks flying. We debated a different topic and we hope to do that again tonight. Um, I want to thank our sponsor for the evening, uh, Qatar Debate, which is part of the Qatar Foundation. They've made tonight possible. You'll hear from them um, at the end, but a big thank you to them. And then I just want to say, um, and, and I, I say this every time I think of really, really good debate, um, it's not my words, they're F. Scott Fitzgerald's words that the sign of a first-rate intellect is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time and still be able to function. Our moderator for tonight, Andrew Ross Sorkin, does that better than anyone I know. So he is surely a first-rate intellect. He is also the founder and the editor-at-large of DealBook, which is a very, very important part of the New York Times business coverage platform that we are now putting a big investment in and expansion around. So we're quite excited about all things DealBook at the moment. I want to invite Andrew and his fellow panelists to come up on stage and take it away. And I just want to say I hear and have seen already some of our panelists beginning to debate each other out in the wild, even before they got here. So thank you again. Thank you, Meredith. Um, we're going to let the, uh, both teams uh, join us on stage right now. Uh, I am Andrew Ross Sorkin uh, from uh, the New York Times uh, and DealBook. Um, 
As Meredith said, here in Davos, we have uh, heard a lot about tech, um, and we've also heard a lot about responsibility, the responsibility of companies to society and how they're supposed to fulfill those duties and how government should or should not try to enforce compliance. And so our debate tonight um, is really a debate uh, about a very specific proposition. And that proposition, namely, is big tech cannot be trusted to self-regulate. We have heard from people like Mark Benioff at Salesforce who has said that big tech needs to be regulated. We've seen a sort of schizophrenic uh, view from the likes of Facebook and Google who have for many years have come to Davos and said, please don't regulate us, we can do it ourselves. And now you're seeing in the last 12 months um, word from them that maybe they should be regulated, calls for by themselves to be regulated. So today we're going to debate this very topic, and in just a few years it's been clear to all of us that tech platforms, these of course the big players, and I just mentioned some of the names, but there are others as well, have transformed our economies and societies while having such an extraordinary impact on all of us. And so really the question is whether a new regulatory oversight needs to change the tech landscape for good, or can these companies really be relied upon to self-regulate? So tonight is an Oxford-style debate. That's how we're doing this. And I want to begin with a couple just words about the format and how we're going to do it also to, uh, to, to our, uh, our debaters on the stage. To start with, let me just say, this is intended to be fun. We want to have a ball <laughs> up here. Take your gloves off. Get your grenades out. Um, no. We want this to be like nothing you have seen at Davos thus far. I promise you that. Uh, and we really hope that it's going to encourage, as Meredith said, ideas. We want people to think. That's what this is about tonight. We want people to think. Uh, the teams are going to now alternate speakers, with each speaker having three minutes uh, for and against. And I'm going to call the speakers up in pairs, and we'll have those speakers uh, speak round by round by round. Now, I will provide hand signals to you both. There's a clock right here. And I will, you got, we're going to have to keep to the three minutes. Um, I will give you the hand signal at 30 seconds. My five is the 30 seconds. Um, but I will not be polite when the three minutes are up. So you really do have to be up. I will cut you off. After we have heard from each of the debate rounds, we're going to invite our esteemed judges up. And we have some Simon Cowells here tonight. So it's going to be, it's going to be something. Um, and we're going to get their views on all of this, and so we're going to invite you up, and we hope that you will speak to what you have heard and help us frame how to think about it. However, and this is important, even though we are calling you the judges, you are not to actually come to a final conclusion. Okay? You're going to have one and a half minutes. Each judge will have one and a half minutes to reflect upon what we have just seen. Unlike the Senate. Unlike the Senate. Um, and then... We're going to take a pause. And during this pause, both teams will have an opportunity to reflect upon what the judges have said. We will then invite both teams back for a final rebuttal, closing remarks. And then we are going to bring it to you, our audience. So I know that uh, there's a lot of people here who are into technology. Um, there's lots of different ways that you, you like to be very precise. It's a very precise group. But the way that we're going to do this is a very rigorous method to figure out who won, and that is through applause. Um, we are encouraging whooping uh, and anything else that you whistling, all of it. Um, and that's how we're going to determine our winner. So please uh, be loud, be proud about it. Uh, a final just recap. So here's the deal. On the four team, Okay, this is now, the four team is affirming the motion and arguing that big tech cannot be trusted to self-regulate it, to be self-regulated. We are joined by Shannon Burr of the International Trade Union Confederation, Tristan Harris of the Center for Human Technology, and Lisa Witter of Apolitical. Please give them a hand. Okay, fabulous. You're in the, I love it, I love it. And you know, we're not even serving alcohol tonight. Okay. On the against team, okay, on the against team that will negate the motion, this is arguing that big tech can be trusted to self-regulate. We have Andrew McAfee of MIT, we have Rebecca Messiak of TechSoup, and we have Malcolm Frank of Cognizant. Okay. 
Now, finally, despite the fact that I said we should have grenades and gloves should come off, and this is all deeply serious, but we should also have fun, I want to make clear, really as Meredith said, when it comes to ideas, this is not about people being judged on one's beliefs, uh, but rather really an exercise in all of us trying to put each other in the other shoe, to try to think about all this and recognizing the importance of challenging one's own position by engaging with one another. So that's what this is about tonight. What I want to do right now is, uh, and if you'd applaud, please, as I introduce Sharon Burrow and Andrew McAfee to the stage. Okay. The clock is set. I think my microphone is now back on. And the floor is Sharon's. Okay, so you are the most powerful people tonight because you have the decision. So I want you to think about the age we're living through. It's an age of anger because the trust in governments, major institutions, and it's broken. It's because of the failure to protect people and share prosperity. And the impact of big tech is not helping because they're subverting privacy, competition, and indeed democracies as they become global monopolies with examples of gangster market behaviour forcing their competitors to sell or get out of the market and polling is emerging, and I'm not sure they realise this, that trust in them is breaking down because of product safety and indeed workplace exploitation. So I'm going to put three arguments to you. Globally monopoly power is bad for everybody. The business model confounds belief, and the dehumanising exploitation of labour can never be allowed. So, you know, globally monopoly power. Who has the right to monopoly power? We've never accepted it from governments. Traditionally, we've never accepted it from corporations. In fact, uh, we've had a religion called competition policy, and suddenly these companies seem too big to touch. The business model confounds belief. It's based on data mining with no consent and no reparation, and indeed privacy regulation is simply out the window. And it's not just individual data, it's national and it's company. No other business has such a free run. Think about the competitors in the real economy. You've got equivalent breaches of law, insider trading, corporate espionage, and more that carry penal sanctions, yet fraudulent capture of data and sale Nothing. And the expansion of big tech into many sectors, production, entertainment, health, education, financial services, you can do it all. Pick a company, pick a tribe, you can live your life on one of these platforms. And then, of course, retail, huge and emerging, but all of those other sectors as well. If you think about it, with AI and the Internet of Things, it can only capture the, uh, the uh, deepen the capture of people and uh, with universal servicing, so you might as well choose your technology tribe now. The essence of being human is to choose. And then there's my people, dehumanising labour exploitation. The gruelling working conditions in Amazon, case in point. Warehouses well documented. Injuries, exhaustion, women skipping even, uh, uh, sorry, workers skipping even toilet breaks out of fear of the, losing their jobs suppressing freedom of association, not allowing people voice or rights, even hiring big lawyer firms to condemn them. So the solution... Thank you so very, very much. We're up on the solution. We're up on the solution. Do not let Dracula in charge of the okay. blood bank regulate big tech. Andrew. <laughs> give it up. Give it up for yeah. her. Okay. A absolutely. And stay up there. But hold on, Andrew. Absolutely. Super hold strong strut. That was very nicely read. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. You, you, <laughs> no, th my is, clock. Is, your clock has not started yet. This is part. Have you noticed that our hosts are thoroughly stacking the, the deck okay. against our Yay. side? Here? Okay. So here we go. Three, two, one. How gangster are you? <sighs> uh, first of all, um, this, this debate is incredibly easy. You win, we lose. Our side does not believe that big tech can be completely trusted to self-regulate because nobody on our side believes that any companies or any industry can be completely trusted to self-regulate. We are not libertarian utopians. Nobody over here lives inside Peter Thiel's brain. Now, 
<laughs> Let's talk about a much more interesting debate, which was, we, do we need additional regulation on big tech? We're here in Europe, we're at the home of a really recent fascinating example of additional regulation on big tech, and that body of legislation followed all the rules. It was deliberative, it was legislative, it was not rushed and unfolded over a long period of time. It took place in a part of the world with a deep history of institutions and respect for the law, and it gave us GDPR. Now, let's look at the costs and benefits of GDPR. There are some benefits. The research is a little bit unclear on this. It appears that the biggest benefit of GDPR is increased finger strength because of all the cookie accept buttons that we are pressing. The downsides of GDPR are very, very well understood. The research is really clear on this. There is decreased venture capital investment in Europe, yay if, if for, for your competitiveness policy, and exactly these evil, monopolist, incumbent, scary American tech programs have increased their market share in the of GDPR. So if you want to have more of those kinds of outcomes, by all means, summon the regulators and let's have more of that going on. These giant American tech platforms are really interesting because we should be worried about monopolies when they stop innovating and raise prices and stop treating us well. Huh. The tech platforms are giving us tons of stuff for free, lowering prices and all the other stuff we buy. They're some of the world's biggest investors in R&D, and there's just no sign on the horizon that they're behaving like these big, lazy monopolists out there. You mentioned trust earlier. There was a really interesting trust survey conducted just earlier this month that found that a couple of these giant, scary, uh, uh, fearful American tech companies are among the most trusted institutions in the country for doing the right thing. The only things that scored better were things like your personal physician, the media, the government, the police, Warren Buffett and Warren Trump, all much farther behind. So what could possibly be explaining this deep trust that we have in the platforms? It could be that they're doing the right thing, or Tristan could be right, we'll hear from him in a minute, and they have rewired our central nervous system so deeply that they've implanted the trust module in us. And, and we're like those, those ants that have seconds. wasps laid in their brains and they're just robots of these things. If you believe that, if you believe that story, our course is clear. We, the global elite, as our panelist recommends us, need to rise up and in best Marxist-Leninist tradition, <laughs> destroy property oh, and lead the people <laughs> against their will into a promised land of less technology. If you believe anything like the opposite, our side is the one to vote for. Thank you. Andrew McAfee, we want to thank our first round of debaters. We also want to thank Andrew for providing next year's debate, whether you want to be inside or outside of Peter Thiel's brain. Um, we are going to now have our second round of debaters. I want to introduce Tristan and Rebecca to the stage. Please, give it up. Tristan, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. So how can you self-regulate when your business model is the problem? How much have you paid for your Facebook account recently? Or your Google account? Zero. How are they worth one and a half trillion dollars? What do they mine? Not just your data, your attention. The more attention they get, the more money they make. And their attention business model is directly connected to harms that are actually catastrophic to democracy and your children's mental health. I want to talk about three fallout harms from the business model. The first is mental health. Um, if you want to get someone's attention, what do you do? It's a race to the bottom of the brainstem when there's only so much attention. You have an infinite growth paradigm living on a finite substrate of human attention. You have to figure out and go lower and lower into the brainstem. You have to go into your children's self-image. You have to add beautification filters. You have to have those likes. You have to get variable schedule reinforcement like a slot machine. And after two decades in decline, uh, children's, uh, sorry, teen girl depression, depression symptoms for 10 to 14 year olds after two, two decades in decline went up 170%. That's also up with teen suicides. When you frame the problem in terms of anti-monopoly and pricing and whether we're getting the juicy benefits, we miss the fact that we're getting a congestive heart failure for our society and our children. Second point, polarization. Uh, technology platforms are polarizing us. It's never been harder to agree on anything. Is this by accident or is it by design? It's by design. The business model of attention means that I'm better off giving each person 2.7 billion Truman shows, individual channels where I give you affirmation, not information, which is like taking truth and sending it into a paper shredder and spitting out a fragmented society on the other end. Our entire government in the United States has been hijacked by this process, and it's destroyed our society. One study on this, a dollar actually goes, uh, it costs more for a dollar to go across the aisle in advertising than to stay on the same side, which means that 
Advertising by itself on Facebook, for example, will polarize societies like Moses, splitting societies in half. Third point, climate change. Uh, if you let the machines decide what to put in front of our attention, it's much cheaper to have a machine determine what to put in front of you than to pay a human editor what's credible, worth our time, or accurate. On YouTube, 50% of the videos recommended on the topic of climate change were climate change denial and climate hoax videos. When you realize that you've got societies like in the Philippines where they spend 10 hours a day on social media, and what they're believing is basically this is the new TV, can you solve climate change if you shredded truth, erased consensus, and, and hoaxes and denial actually outcompete uh, truth? 30 seconds. The last point I want to make, uh, actually even in the United States, 22% uh, of Americans who believe in climate change think it's caused by chemtrails. Uh, conspiracy theories spread uh, much faster on social media than not. All I want to say is that much like in industrial capitalism, a whale's worth more dead than alive, a tree's worth more as labor, sorry, a tree's worth more as lumber than as a tree, a human being is worth more if they're addicted, narcissistic, outraged, polarized, and disinformed than if they're a human being. And that's the business model that's causing those outcomes. Tristan Harris, everybody. <laughs> Tristan, 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 you please stay up there. We want to thank you for the idea that Mark Zuckerberg is Moses. Thank you for that. It is now Rebecca's turn. We're going to uh, reset the clock. And the floor, Rebecca, is yours. Thank you. We have global complex problems. They require global solutions that keep pace with the speed of technological innovation. Big tech has the data and the insights on a global set of consumers, and they have an unparalleled ability to innovate. We need big tech to be a motivated contributor to regulation rather than in opposition. They have a lot of lawyers as well. An effective self-regulation model is what really can achieve that. First, I want to say while we debate whether we can trust big tech, it's also worth asking, can we trust governments? Governments have agendas too, and they're at times really not very uh, much in mind of what's best for citizens. And governments are not global where the problems are. Many experts agree that government-led regulation can often backfire. Self-regulation is not blind trust. It's rather a disciplined, multi-stakeholder approach that supports the interests of all parties and protects consumers. It's already a vital part of the global economy across industries like healthcare and nuclear power. The best models of self-regulation -regul involve business and government in a balanced model by the creation of a nonprofit mutual benefit organization. Financial markets have benefited from these kinds of self-regulation models, which were often put in place after very big crises. Um, we need to learn from those lessons and urge big tech to act now. We can trust big tech to self-regulate with a model that engages a diverse set of global stakeholders, businesses, governments, and academia, but also big tech's employees and grassroots civil society. The several million employees in big tech across 50 countries have the potential to meaningfully influence big tech to self-regulate. According to the 2019 Edelman Trust Index, employees trust their employer relationships as within their control. And two out of three employees expect that prospective employers will join them in taking action on societal issues. Google's employees help convince the company to make a billion dollar investment in affordable housing and improve its workers' rights and harass harassment policies. Millions of big tech employees could raise their voices on data privacy and disinformation. The 250 million people who work in civil society also hold great potential to influence big tech in a multi-stakeholder self-regulation model. These people are closest to the vulnerable populations who stand to lose the most from the unintended consequences and who often experience the effect of tech-enabled crime and oppression. 30 seconds. They can make big tech and government smarter about the inequities that tech creates. In the elite parts of society, digital lives make it easy for us to be entertained and consume. In the less developed places, digital access can mean otherwise unavailable medical resources uh, or resources when disaster strikes. Let's challenge big tech. Big tech can be trusted to self-regulate and must be trusted. There is a model that can protect the rights of digital citizens. Rebecca. <laughs> big government is bad, go big tech. Okay, we have our third and final session of debaters before our Simon Cowells make it to the stage. Let me introduce Lisa and Malcolm. Come on, people. This is our finale here, our big finale. 
Okay. You ready? The clock is set. Hold on. We have to have a reset on the clock. I need to talk to our timekeeper. It's an Apple device. Okay. The floor is yours. So to make my point, I have four song titles that add a little ditty to what we're doing to make it sticky. I hope to make it a little fun. My first song title is Bringing Sexy Back by Justin Timberlake. I love that one of the hot topics here at Davos is governance. Like who in a million years thought that like governance would be sexy? You by being here is making governance sexy. If we make it sexy, we'll do it better. Song number one. <laughs> song number two, I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys. Some old people in the room. First and foremost, big Davos. tech is calling for this regulation. The stuff is all over the place. I feel so sorry. I'm glad, Andrew, you seeded the ground to win already. It's kind of the mic drop moment. Let me tell you why. When I decided to go on this debate, I put out to Facebook, <laughs> um, I'm going on this debate. What should I read and what should I do and what should I learn? I got an email back from Nick Clegg's office saying, I've got some stuff for you to read about regulation. First, he sent a Mark, uh, March 30th, 2019 op-ed in the Washington Post by Mark Zuckerberg titling, The Internet Needs New Rules, A Call for Regulation. Clegg's own paper says, here's a newsflash. Facebook wants to be regulated. This may seem counterintuitive. After all, what big company actually wants to be re regulated? We do. It's not limited to Facebook. Brad Smith of Microsoft said it. It's not enough, not fast enough. Alphabet CEO said it. Anyone see him with Klaus yesterday? We need to regulate. They want it that way. Song three, my favorite, No Parking on the Dance Floor by Midnight Star. You know it. No Parking on the Dance Floor. You know that one? It's good. So I want to explain to you what a regulator is. It sounds really boring, like a gray blob person showing up to say no to people. First off, they're not that. They're referees and intermediaries. They work to protect all parties. They don't want to hurt citizens, and they don't want them unduly burdened, but they also love the tax revenue that pays for the health care and the schools. They're out for a win-win for everyone. And it isn't us versus them. It's not regulate and stop or go all the way. There's lots of middle ground. There's high regulation and low regulation. <clears throat> Secondly, they are learning together through this complexity. Very few people understand what the heck's going on, what's going on with AI. CEOs are asking for help. Just think, not even Boeing's engineers and management knew, in a self-regulated regime, what they were doing around the Boeing Max 737 tragedy. Imagine government working together with more open regulation, what that could have done. 30 seconds. And government speeding up their approaches. Lots of agile approaches. I want to leave you with my four song. You got to believe by the Pointer Sisters. <laughs> Finally, and most importantly, what's most dangerous about these people's arguments is that they try to undercut the idea of government all together. Ironically, because that's what these platforms are doing. My opponents may be spreading cynicism about trust, which is true on some levels, but so not true on other levels. And imagine life without a referee. I hear stories all the time about what's working in And the referee says thank you. You've got to believe. Give it up for Lisa and the Backstreet Boys. You've got to stay up there. We're going to dance when this is over. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to reset the clock. The timekeeper has it. It is big tech keeping the, keeping the numbers. And it's your turn, Malcolm, to defend him. All right, Midnight Star, you went deep. That's impressive. Um, so three topics in three minutes. I'm going to talk about you, I'm going to talk about economics, and I'm going to talk about innovation. So let's start with you. Do not be a Davos diva. We know those folks, those, Hippocratic, or those, those hypocrites who love to talk about others, who love to say, do as I say, but not as I do because all of us in this room on average are spending more than four hours a day on digital platforms. Now, are we all in the clutches of evil algorithms? Or have you all done that on your own free will? Because in the last 20 years, big tech has brought to us remarkable connectivity, utility, and yes, even joy. It's been 12 years since we had the introduction of the iPhone. We are all very experienced with this. So I just ask you, inspect your own behavior, your own actions, and your own motivations, and simply ask yourself, what is true for you? Because the answer most likely is that each of us here has already voted with our fingers very affirmatively to reject this motion. Number two, economics. I call this the itch to switch. Switching costs are unbelievably low for this industry. 
You don't like, they're literally free in about five seconds of your time. You don't like Google Maps? Go to Apple Maps. Don't like Bing? Go to Google, so forth and so on. The list goes on and on and on. With such insanely low switching costs, digital companies are already, already properly regulated in many important ways. The public reaction to missteps or oversteps of these companies will be swift and overwhelming and completely transparent. Why? Because of the platforms they created in the first place. Does anybody remember when MySpace became super creepy? Do we even remember MySpace? A couple of years ago, what happened with Uber and the behavior of their management team? It gave this lift, well, to lift. Number three, and probably most important, is innovation. Be very, very careful for what you wish. You need to reject this motion because we cannot kill the golden goose of innovation. Kara Swisher, New York Times, has a wonderful quote where she said, right now Silicon Valley is big brains focused on small things. Focus on 30 the next, seconds. next thing on Instagram, so forth and so on. But we're about to get to the good stuff. Big brains focused on big things. And that is how do we transform the healthcare system from sick care to true wellness, radically improving lives? How do we ensure the educational system enables all of all to find their true potential? How do we stop the carnage of a million deaths per year on our roads? This is the collective opportunity in front of us if we allow big tech to continue on its current rate of innovation. Give it up for Malcolm and his, and his novel approach to win you over by calling you all hypocrites. We are going to now have our debaters listen to an evaluation by our Simon Cowles. We have three judges this evening who are going to try to frame a view without providing a final verdict, which we're going to all leave to you. It is my privilege and pleasure to bring Dr. Mohamed Baraj to the stage for two and a half minutes, <laughs> exactly. We have our clock ready. And tell us what you thought. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So we let Google tell us which route to take to our destination. We let Apple Watch tell us how many steps we need to take for, uh, for the day. And some of us even let Facebook tell us whom to vote for. Good evening. So um, I'd like to congratulate first uh, both teams on a wonderful debate, one which I believe will reflect upon in the near future. An extension to uh, Mrs. Sharon's note on the global monopoly power. Uh, according to a recent poll by the Amnesty International found that 72% of respondents across nine different countries express fear on how big tech firms uh, collect and use their data. Also, in a much more focus to the Gulf region, another study developed by myself and Dr. Chapuis on the Gulf region found that 68% of respondents express the same fear. So it's safe to say that there's an international concern, international public concern, which requires immediate remedy. Uh, quick remarks to the opposing team. Um, I believe that this is a human-centric discussion. Yet, uh, most of the services provided by big tech firms are delivered through algorithms. And there's so many examples that we can bring on the table, but we don't have enough time. But one of which uh, is basically uh, a lady, a lady's job application was rejected due to a glitch in the algorithm which favored men over women's CVs. Uh, also, I think that there was an opportunity for big tech firms to uh, to innovate and to shape their own policy space. However, after some time now, several data breaches, several uh, algorithm glitches, and privacy concerns, of course, I believe that they have missed this opportunity. To the, uh, to the uh, supporting team, regulations is, uh, is something good by nature. 30 seconds. However, uh, sometimes it comes with the unintended consequences. Uh, I would be interested to learn your thoughts about how will regulations address the complex, the diverse, and the evolving nature of technology. Thank you so much. Thank you. And he does it with 15 seconds to spare, no less. That made Fox News sound fair and balanced. <laughs> Very fair and balanced. We're gonna, we're gonna, the gloves are now going to come off because Shamita Singh is going to come to the stage. And we're going to hear what's really going on here. I think they missed the boat. What about you guys? Come on. Shocker. 
I was going to, okay, Andrew, um, let's see here. So he stole all my best lines. So, and, and she's about to steal all my best lines. So whatever he said and she said um, are really what you should listen to. I was going to yield my time to the one that y'all thought gave the best, gave the best remarks, but here's a couple of things to think about. Where'd you come up with those song titles? Oh yeah, they're in me. They're in you, right? <laughs> You know, and the exploitation of workers, interesting approach, interesting approach. <laughs> the attention, pretty, yeah, <laughs> maybe. The attention economy, <laughs> really interesting way to look at it. But really, can we get some examples of why you guys didn't regulate in the first place? Like, really, does it take a scandal and a civilization that's gone completely haywire for you guys to wake up? Give us some examples of how that, why, why we shouldn't. Um, it's not a battle between good and evil. I mean, good and evil. It's, it's not even a battle of, but, but the question is really, is there something around the responsibility of citizens that we should be thinking about in this addicted economy? Is there responsibility, is it really big tech? Is it all of big tech or should there be some of big tech? Is it, is it big tech AI? Is it big tech data? Is it big tech platform? Is it big tech software, hardware? Is there anything in there that we could maybe get in front of? Just some of the things that I'm thinking about. But again, I say, he has the best lines, and she's going to come up with the right solution. So enjoy the evening, everybody. Thank Shamina, you. the next judge on American Idol. Shamina, thank you so much. It is now Helen Clark's turn to give us a final thought about how we should all think about the debate that we just observed. Helen, so, the clock is on. Great arguments on both sides. I was a bit surprised that the affirmative didn't acknowledge how damn tough it is to regulate. I think you could have made a case about the, these companies uh, are going to try and find a way around every regulatory you know, thing you put around them. But like, so regulators are like generals fighting the last war, you know, always trying to plug a gap uh, uh, here or there. I think there's an argument there. I think the uh, other side had a point about not stifling innovation because there are benefits, uh, clearly, from uh, uh, the platform. So finding regulation that's sensitive, that's uh, important. I was also a little bit uh, surprised that the affirmative didn't uh, bring up you know, the demonstrable harms of harboring terrorist groups, uh, hate speech, and so on, uh, more explicitly as reasons for, uh, for, for regulation. But you know, great arguments there, nonetheless. Now, coming to the negative side, uh, I was a bit surprised that the lead speaker kind of gave it away in the first line. You know, yes, there's a case for regulation, but then sort of spun his way back uh, out of that uh, uh, again. But my jaw dropped open when he said, you know, hey, what's wrong? The companies are giving you all this stuff for free. Hang on, what are they taking from us? They're taking from us our personal information and then turning it against us to make us sort of, you know, objects of... Of, uh, of, of sales for, for whatever they, the algorithm uh, judges that we might uh, uh, want to buy. Uh, secondly, I thought there was a deficiency in not uh, answering the question, who holds the self-regulators to account? You know, self-regulation, that judge and jury. Uh, that's uh, not really uh, acceptable. Uh, and third, points made towards the end, the fact that it has delivered benefits is not a reason for it not being regulated. So I think really uh, those are all, all points I'd like them to take on board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We want to thank our jury for their thoughtful comments and ideas. What we're going to do now is try to give both teams an opportunity to confer amongst themselves, to try to answer some of the questions that were posed. Andrew, did you, in fact, give up in the first sentence? I'm curious on this side, do we actually believe the tech companies when they say they want to be regulated, or is that just marketing? So we're going to hear from them in just a moment. They're going to confer. They're going to come back to us in just a moment, and we'll have a minute and a half to offer some closing remarks and final rebuttals. But while they confer, we're going to show you a film about press freedom and tech 
and what the New York Times is doing about it. Let's take a look. Hello, this is Austin Armand from the New York Times. We didn't know what kinds of people we were upset on. Like something's fucked up in the scene, I don't know what it is. Something's wrong. But I swear after I'm making New York Times. I am really worried. Somebody had gone through all of my stuff. They are uh, coming after me. Like, I think we're all being hacked. The government had this Orwellian grip on society. My fear is that they, um, that it showed a willingness to kill. Check it out. That's the direction of government. If they want to touch you, they will. We're going to be adding a slide to that presentation uh, for when you get a WhatsApp from MBS. That's, that's coming in the next, <laughs> next version of the presentation. Um, really, we're going to do an instructional video, actually, about what you're supposed to do when that happens. Um, I believe we've given both teams, everybody feel like they've conferred, thumbs up on both sides. Okay. Now, you, both teams can, can appoint one person to make their final case. Who is it on this side? Okay. Tristan's going to make his way up. Does he have... You, Lisa, you've given him some song titles. Okay. Uh. Um, who is going to be on the other side of this? Andrew. Well, three of us, but I'm going to take You're going to represent. Back. Come join me. I don't know if there's conferral like this. Oh, you're going to all stand. Well, as long as the clock runs, they can this, do whatever they this want. Is, this is new. Um, it's a minute 30. This is when the, the referee is losing uh, control of the situation. Um, we will go for and against, and the clock is on for the four side. Closing remarks. My final song title is It's the Final Countdown for Democracy. Go. All right. I want to argue that instead of talking about whether we should regulate the world, let's recognize that technology deregulated the world. We used to have protections for Saturday morning cartoons. You have time, manner, place restrictions, what you can and can't show children. When you virtualize that into YouTube, all those protections got, we lost them. You used to have protections for equal price election ads. You used to have same price for one candidate at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night is the other candidate on television. You virtualize in that into Facebook, you create actual inequalities. So we actually have, when software eats the world, we've actually deregulated the world. And that deregulation has actually caused all the catastrophic harm. So the entire debate is actually about how do we retrieve the laws, principles, and things that protected us from these things uh, that we need to bring back. On the economics front, we actually have a subprime attention economy. We're selling fake attention, shallower, th thinner, thinner slices of junk attention assets as if they're real, to, it also fake clicks to fake users, aka bots, uh, to uh, fake with fake reporting to advertisers. Facebook was reported to actually have inflated their advertising numbers by 900%. So we have a subprime attention economy in the same way we had a subprime financial crisis. Um, and this is leading overall with democracy sort of to a digital dark ages. While we've been tech protecting the physical borders, if Russia tries to fly a plane into the United States, we had a Pentagon. When they try to fly a plane into the virtual world information space, Facebook greets them with an algorithm, says, which zip code do you want to target? We'll take you right Five in. Five seconds. So if you want democracy to die, then let these guys win. It's, it's not the technology, it's the, the business side. model. The fourth side. We're going to reset the clock, and we're going to get our closing remarks from the against side. The floor is yours. To be honest, I thought we came in here as the underdogs, so I was a little surprised to see that instead of having a fair three-on-three -three debate, our host staged a six-on-three debate. It makes, makes me think our position might have been a little stronger than I initially realized. When one of my opponents was taking us on a tour of songs written before most of us, we, before most of us were born, uh, one of her titles was You Gotta Believe. And what you guys are, are just intense about is believing in the benevolent, all-seeing, disinterested, wonderful regulator who can hide the complexity of the modern world and make them all go away. And you remind me of a kid falling asleep on Christmas Eve waiting for, the, waiting for Santa Claus to show up. Um, we got to grow up. 
and we got to be the people actually wrapping the presents and putting them under the tree. It's just harder than that. Well, my all-time favorite insult is one I'm going to close with. Um, <laughs> When, when Neville Chamberlain came back from, the, from Munich, uh, thinking that he had secured a deal for peace in our time, uh, Hitler gave him, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Churchill gave him the greatest insult that I have ever heard. He said, you faced a choice between war and dishonor. You chose dishonor, you will still have war. You all think we're facing a choice between regulation and turbulence. You want regulation? We'll still have turbulence. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Very nice. Very nice. If I could ask both sides, that, that's very nice that you're at least shaking hands. I like that there's some, oh, hugs are going on. Hold on, folks. We got, it's, it's, you know, it's a new time. It's a new time. We gotta be, gotta be careful. Okay. <laughs> so, um, here's what we're gonna do. Get your vocal cords ready, people. Um, I am going to, uh, present one side or the other, and it is your chance to uh, clap, to whoop, to whistle, or do whatever. You can even stamp if you want. Here we go. I'm gonna ask you as our final judges to move to a vote. I ask you to please put your hands together right now if you believe the four side who argued that big tech cannot be trusted to self-regulate made the stronger case. <laughs> And, and clearly, length of applause and the dancing is going to count in all of this. Okay, now, for those of you who believe that the against side, that big tech can be trusted to self-regulate, made the stronger case, put your hands together. Excuse me, my boss uh, says that we are going to do this one more time because at the moment, it seems like a tie. It's a little bit like our editorial page. I thought you'd get the joke. Okay. We're going to do it one more time. If anybody has some kind of big technology, that actually can, can, can actually tell us, that would help. But if you are on the four side, make some noise. <laughs> if you... On the against side, make some noise. <laughs> it's tough. Le okay. We will do a final verdict and we will do a show of hands because I think everyone may have been too polite in all of this, frankly. There were people who were whooping for both sides. Okay. Here we go. If you are for the four side, raise your hand. Okay, bring them down. I think we know the answer. But if you are for the against side, raise your hand. I think the answer is clear. Mark Zuckerberg is Moses. The four side wins. So, Andrew, Andrew, stay with me for this. I, I just want to take a moment and say to the six of you, that was a 
stunning thing to listen to. It was also unlike every other Davos event because people stuck to their time, largely. <laughs> and and I, you put so much time and effort into this. I want to do a really quick highlight reel of unforgettable things said on both sides. For the affirmers, actually, I'll go to you. Since you won, I'm going to go to you second. For the againsters, it's really confusing. For the againsters, um, Andrew told us, if you do get out of Peter Thiel's head, don't go to Europe. Rebecca, Rebecca told us um, that the best models involve business and government. You, you said that kind of quietly, but giant, giant point. She also told us, and I love this, nobody else really talked about this. Sharon might have a little bit. She said, employees are the unsung power here, basically, they can hold their companies to account, and we can hold them to account for holding their companies to account. I thought that was very interesting. Um, Malcolm told us that we were either hypocrites or divas, um, and he, he also said that we have a chance to exercise our own will in this, and that makes, should make us really question the against side. For the affirmers, uh, Sharon, gangster monopoly moves. I'm going to use that everywhere I go. I love that. Um, you said really quietly, I don't know if people caught it, that the essence of being human is to choose. Um, it was in so many other points. I want to make people sure people heard that. And then Andrew cut you off, as you were saying, in case you missed, don't let Dracula regulate the blood bank, which I just loved. Um, Tristan, where's Tristan? Tristan, a couple of comments that were really dear to my heart, though I don't take a side here. Pay a human editor, thank you. Um, and you, you also said, you also said, and I have, it's only the second half of this that I really applaud, I have no position on the first, regulate, because society needs the truth. <laughs> um, you also gave us, a human is worth more when they are addicted and narcissistic than as a human being, which I think is an unforgettable comment. Lisa, you have excellent music taste, debatable by Andrew. And I think you set up the big question that Andrew raised that didn't really get answered, if I'm being fair. fair. Are CEOs really asking? for this. I want to thank our incredible judges, Mahmoud, Shamina, and Helen. Really striking. You gave us, does it take a scandal or society on the brink for this to happen? I think it was Helen who said, it is goddamn hard to regulate. We shouldn't forget that. And I love, um, I just love Sorkin on, let's all go away and think about do we believe the CEOs really want to be regulated? On final comments, we know that Andrew doesn't like uh, Lisa's music taste, um, but I will remember uh, you, want, you want regulation, you will still have turbulence. And to Tristan, tech deregulated the world. That is a big meta idea, and we are living in a subprime attention economy. So to all of you, I want to say giant thank you for the effort you put in to an argument that you may be in your real life either for or against. It's clear there was this was a real debate in the room, and I want to invite um, Abdul Rahman up to the stage. Abdul is from Qatar Debate, again, part of the Qatar Foundation. We are so grateful to them for making tonight possible, and really grateful to all of you for this great participation. Thank you. So I'd like to thank the debaters for this heated and unique uh, debate and the judges for their uh, feedback. Uh, today's, uh, today's motion is a relevant topic for us at Qatar Debate, where our business is to create a critical thinkers who will make important decisions for our future. The truth is we need to think very carefully about how we manage and regulate technology to benefit us and what kind of uh, critical thinking skills, we need to navigate the world of technology. We will continue uh, our dialogue and debates this March in Doha, where we will host hundreds of youth to discuss this topic with other different motions as well uh, in the international championship. 
uh, finally, I would like to thank New the New York Times for this distinguished collaboration, and we hope that it will continue in the years to come. And also, I would like to thank my colleagues from Qatar Foundation for their uh, great coverage for this event and everyone who showed up tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And a final whoop, if we could, for everybody on the stage, our judges as well. Thank you for being with us. We'll do it all again next year here in Davos. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.